significant growth in new jobs. We also have uh, high and rising levels of unemployment as more South Africans enter the labor market. And at the fiscal level, we have a more constrained fiscal space, more limited ability to use the budget, and a rising debt, public debt, that we need to factor into our thinking. So that's briefly the economic environment. The policy environment, on the other hand, is one where many South Africans are excluded from key parts of the economy. They're excluded as workers. Anyone who's unemployed doesn't have that critical economic citizenship that is represented by a job. They're excluded from significant parts of ownership, management, and control of the economy. They're excluded from opportunities to be entrepreneurs. And that underlies and underpins the call by the ruling party for radical economic transformation, something that addresses this. And the radical economic transformation, just to share with the uh, members of uh, the, the audience who are here today, represents a series of changes and interventions that deals with matters as diverse as the structure of the economy, ownership patterns, uh, management, uh, issues of institutions, so that we can unlock both growth and transformation, so that we can benefit all South Africans, but we ensure that uh, our principal focus is on the poor, the majority of whom are African and women. Now, we've made significant gains. We've made significant gains since 1994, I can give you a metric that represents that, and that metric is electricity, where in 1994, a minority of people in South Africa had access to electricity. 5.2 million homes were electrified. Today, we're looking at a significant larger number, about 15 million homes that have access to electricity. We've made significant gains even in the last five years, in complex global circumstances where commodity prices have softened and we are a big exporter of commodities, where the global economy has not fully recovered from the 2008-09 global economic crisis, and one where we've seen the rise more recently of economic nationalism and economic populism that potentially closes markets elsewhere in the world. Just since the last national policy conference of the ruling party, we've seen 1.7 million additional jobs created. Today, from this morning when you're having breakfast to this evening when you are going to have dinner, the state would have invested over the course of this working day more than a billion rand in infrastructure development, in laying the foundations of growth and service delivery. But we must recognize our circumstances are challenging. We have a technical recession which potentially can deepen. We've had credit downgrades that are significant to us because they affect not only investor confidence but also the cost of paying back the national debt. We have large numbers of young people who legitimately ask where are their opportunities as workers, as skilled contributors in the economy, and as entrepreneurs. So our roadmap to move from where we are to where we want to be has at least four elements in our thinking. The first is a credible growth plan in the context, the constrained circumstances that I've pointed to. A credible growth plan that points to sectors with high economic potential, sectors that can grow, that can create more jobs, that can attract investment. But it also involves effective implementation, implementation within government and implementation within the private sector. 
The second part of our roadmap is to transform the economy, to make it more inclusive, to give opportunities to more black South Africans, to young people, to the rural excluded and to the urban unemployed. And critically for us to address issues of economic concentration. The third area is integrity in government. To be seen and to act swiftly against corruption and to deal with the state capture allegations both honestly and swiftly. To ensure that we manage our state-owned companies in the interest of all South Africans, that our fiscal policies are sustainable, and that we inspire confidence in our people. And the fourth element is to deepen partnerships. Government is a powerful instrument, but government cannot pull a society forward alone. It needs partners. It needs partners in the private sector, businesses that are here today, businesses elsewhere who are not present today, who need to join hands with us. It needs partners with organized labor, with trade unions, with workers who produce the wealth of our country to say, how do we work together to ensure that we create more jobs, we bring more investment into the economy, we grow this economy, and we transform it. And partnerships is about everybody bringing something in order to increase the size of the economy, and that in the economy that all South Africans can, can take, can benefit from. Now, in the public discussion, there's been a significant concentration on issues of economic exclusion. How to make sure that our economy does better and that our economy delivers to ordinary South Africans. So I want to look briefly at issues of ownership of and control in the economy. And I'm going to give a case study of the work of the competition authorities. That's the Competition Commission and the Competition Tribunal, and ultimately, through their work, also the Competition Appeal Court. Over the last eight years or so, we've begun to re-engineer the work of the competition authorities. And they've focused on two key areas. And in future, they will focus on a third one. The first area they focus on is mergers and acquisitions. What should apply when one company buys another? And the second one is they focused on cartels and abuse of market dominance. So let me give you an example to illustrate what it is that an ANC-led government seeks to do. Coca-Cola recently announced uh, that it wanted to amalgamate a number of its bottling operations, introduce efficiencies, and then later ensure change in the overall shareholding. So they come to the competition authorities and government and they put that proposition on the table because in our Competition Act, they come via a regulatory process. By the end of the discussion, as we engage with this multinational corporation, we reached an agreement with them, an agreement that seeks to advance the national development goals of our country. And the areas we focus on and that we reach agreement on include the following. One, that they need to ensure that the merger supports jobs. So Coca-Cola has given a commitment that effectively means that for a five-year period, they will maintain the aggregate levels of employment in the South African economy. Second, we ask them to ensure that the ownership structures represent a transformed ownership. So they've committed to move from 11% black economic participation in their shareholding uh, progressively to 30% BEE ownership in the shareholding. Third, they agreed that they'll set aside 800 million rand in a fund. A fund that will support small businesses, bring black farmers into their supply chain, ensure that township enterprises are supported, and that we in fact ensure that the footprint of a large company supports the development of more South Africans as active economic citizens in our country. Fourth, 
they agreed that an iconic South African brand called Appletizer that was bought over uh, by the Coca-Cola group will remain committed to South Africa. Production will be here local, that more of Apple ties and grape ties will be exported to the rest of the world, that Apple ties itself will have a minimum of 20% BEE ownership, and that Apple ties will buy more local products like grapes and apples and pears. And by the way, just in the space of one year, they've increased their procurement of red grapes from less than 10% to more than 40% as a result of that agreement. And finally, they committed that they would open up Spaza shops. You know, in Spaza shops, the fridges are largely owned by the big companies like Coca-Cola. And the condition to that fridge is you can only stock products of one company, Coca-Cola. And we've said you've got to empower small Spaza shop owners to have choice, to bring in the products of competitors so that consumers in townships have choice, so there's a bit of price competition so that Spaza shop owners can make a bit more money. And they've agreed that 10% of Spaza, uh, of these fridge space and display cabinets in the very small Spaza shops will be available for competitors. Now, I've taken that as an example. I could have given you one of 10, 20, 30 examples to illustrate that purpose of government that is focused on transformation can use the economic toolbox to ensure that all South Africans benefit from this economy. Let me use the example of cartels. These are examples where private sector companies, uh, or any company really in the economy, uh, colludes, cooperates with their competitors, uh, that has the effect essentially of carving up markets, of increasing prices, of reducing competition. It's not allowed in our, in our law. So the competition authorities have been working actively over the last number of years, building up their capability to catch companies who are engaged in these practices, because these practices don't help South Africans. And we've been very successful, and there are many, many parts of the economy that we have, in fact, cracked down. Let me just give a few small examples of cases that have been successfully concluded. The first is the example of fertilizers. Fertilizers are important because they represent a big input for farmers, and so they affect the price of food, food on the tables of South Africans. So a large South African company, Sassol, is also a producer of the feedstock that goes into fertilizers. And we uncovered that Sassol had deep uh, concentration right at the top through the blending of the fertilizers right up to the selling of the fertilizers to farmers. And we saw that they were in breach of the competition laws. And we were able to get a remedy agreed there that they must break up their blending operations and sell five of the six blenders to other, uh, to other entrepreneurs. That's an example where you can act decisively as the state. A second example is the construction industry. Construction industry were, uh, were uh, accused of, uh, of, of collusion in the 2010 World Cup and in some of the other associated products. Uh, they uh, were investigated by the Competition Commission, and a number of them stepped forward when the, when the investigation was underway and said, look, let's come clean, we prepare to acknowledge what we've done and enter into settlement with the state. One element of that settlement and there was a comprehensive set of areas, but one part of it said, open up the construction industry, bring more black South Africans into it, stimulate competition there, ensure that there's integrity from the private sector, because issues of integrity and corruption is not just in the public sector, it's also in the private sector. And today we have a commitment and an agreement with the construction industry that is something of a, uh, an example to other sectors. Murray and Roberts, for example, have just sold off the entire construction business to a black South African consortium. 100% will now be owned by a black South African consortium. A major company like Avenge will be selling about 50% of their equity to black South Africans. A big company like WBHO will take three 
black-owned construction companies and help to lift their turnover to 25% that of WBH, uh, WHBO in the next few years. Now these are examples, I've just selected them, of real efforts to transform and bring opportunities to black South Africans based on entrepreneurship, based on all South Africans having access to the economy. Citizenship, politically, is represented most powerfully by the right to vote. That was where 1994 got us. Citizenship in the economy is represented powerfully by a job, by an entrepreneurial opportunity, by the ability to be a manager or an owner in the economy. And that's what we're getting through a number of these agreements. Let me take the example of ArcelorMittal. It's a major steel maker in South Africa. They were uh, uh, investigated by the competition authorities for their, uh, their uh, anti-competitive behavior in, in steel. By the end of the discussion, when we concluded the settlement, they paid a major fine to the competition authorities, and that goes back to the National Revenue Fund, so they help to ensure that we build houses and uh, provide health care for South Africa's people. But critically, they also committed that they're going to boost investment in the steel mills, put 4.6 billion rand extra investment in South Africa so that they inject investment liquidity in our market, and also that they would do a BEE deal to transform ownership in the steel industry. Now these are examples I've given, some of many, many others that we can cite, of real, tangible, bold actions by government to transform this economy and to grow the economy. Now where, do, where to from here? We're still faced with significant levels of economic concentration in the economy. That's not good for South Africans, it's not good for growth, and it's not good for jobs. So we are looking at changing the mandate of the competition authorities, giving them more power and more authority to investigate where there are high levels of concentration and to give effective remedies to deal with those. So we will be introducing through the cabinet process uh, amendments to the Competition Act that takes this uh, important institution, the competition authorities, and give them a wider remit so that we help to ensure that our economy, in fact, is inclusive, that all South Africans have opportunity, that exclusion must be something of the past, not something of the present or the future. I want to begin to conclude by saying that the actions on competition and concentration that we're taking uh, are part of a wider package of interventions. Infrastructure investment is critical to growth. In this year ahead alone, we are committing uh, and working with the private sector to, un, uh, to unblock uh, investment in infrastructure. And what we seek to be able to do is pump 330 billion rand into public and private infrastructure. This would be rebuilding the foundations of growth. You need energy. You need logistic systems to move your goods around. You need water supply. You need infrastructure in the ICT area, broadband and fiber optic cables. And South Africa's people need healthcare services and schools, and uh, they need access to services in communities. They're all a product of infrastructure investment. Industrial funding, we've asked the Industrial Development Corporation for this year ahead to dig deep into their resource base, to work their balance sheet actively, and to commit between 15 and 18 billion rand of fresh investment in the economy. And to, because the IDC has private sector counterparts, to attract up to 30 billion rand of private sector investment in those projects so that we can get South Africa working. We've set up a 1.5 billion rand steel competitiveness fund to deal with the, the challenge of the global glut in steel markets. We're bringing new foreign investment in. A major Chinese automaker is, uh, is opening a new car-making plant 
in Nelson Mandela Bay. And they're going to bring, it's an investment of 4.3 billion rand, the first new auto plant in more than 40 years, by the way, that has been set up in South Africa. We're bringing new foreign and domestic investors in as partners in Score Metals, a major steel-making company. And finally, by way of example, we know we're a data-driven society, that the 21st century is the century of data, that what oil and steel was to the 20th century, our cell phones, our laptops, and the information uh, technologies that we use will be the critical fuel. Data costs must come down. I think all South Africans will agree to that. So we've launched now a market inquiry, and I can see both here uh, uh, among the attendees in the breakfast, and I'm sure South Africans sitting at home want to pay less for data on their cell phones, on their laptops. So we're starting, we're going to be having a market inquiry where the competition authorities will lift the lid. Find out what's happening to prices. How do we compare with international players? How can we bring data costs down? What are the recommendations that we need to look at? Let me wrap up. I am speaking here to business representatives. We need your help. We need the help of trade unions and workers. We need a more effective state, that partnership of an effective private sector, effective representation of the voice of workers, effective government can ensure that we build on the many successes and that we acknowledge the challenges we are, but that we build on those strengths to deal with the challenges that we face that we create jobs, that we deepen economic development, that we grow this economy inclusively, and that we transform the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Minister. Okay, so now we have the conversation. Can I have an indication who wants to start the round? I've got uh, one indication, two indications, three, four. We'll do four or five in this round. So I'll take these four that we've seen so far. Let's start at the back table that we had there. Can we get the mic there quickly? Good morning. Um, the name is Tabara Mule from Ikansa Holdings. I, I will start off with what I asked um, when the Minister of Davis was presenting with regards to value supply chain of these companies. Much as it's nice to have your accelerometers coming into agreements, we often find that there is no black traders. Like, they don't have the people who are black who are buying like your Max Steels, like your NJRs from accelerometer and directly into the market, making it more difficult because of us as black suppliers have to then buy from your make steels and AG, NGRs, making our competitiveness very difficult. So we must find a way to getting into those guys and saying, as you create people who will be selling directly to your customers, create black ones as well. That's, that's just the first point that I want to point out. Um, the second one, which is a very contentious issue, I've debated with many people, um, is that um, on the automotive side and the banks, there's an issue of VAT that when you finance your car as a person, the bank charges you interest on VAT and yet they claim it back. Now, how do you pay for VAT for five years when they claim it back within two months? That's, that's very contentious and please look at it because if it can save millions or billions of rents for many consumers and the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, in the middle, we had an indication. Front table, middle. Is it me? Good morning, distinguished guests and minister. Thank oh, you. I didn't think that was the middle, but nevertheless. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was for the next round, but mm. I saw the mic come my way, Daryl. Thank you very much for that opportunity. It's going to cost you extra now, eh? <laughs> you haven't got Jewish blood, do you? No. Uh, my name is Gino Dalfava. Uh, I hail from Umtata. I'm an entrepreneur in the freight and logistics uh, sector, which is highly capital intensive, TG, as you would know. 
uh, it's untransformed and it's monopolized by those German multinationals, DHL and DSV. I think most of the business people in the room know them. So it is highly capital intensive and so it doesn't allow for new black entrants like ourselves. I've been in that space for 40 years and I'm so glad that the 4,000 delegates next door are discussing the ocean's economy, TG and uh, the Operation Pakis and how black uh, South Africans can participate in this economy. But my question to Minister Patel is, as you alluded to, um, that government is looking at the corruption element. As an entrepreneur for 40 years, um, when we go to B show and these government departments, we see the arrogance from the public servants. They treat us like scum. So uh, the ANC, since the advent of the democracy with Madiba, we have a wonderful constitution and wonderful policies, DG, but they are not implemented by these lazy, slothful public servants. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll come to the middle. Yeah? The front table in the middle. Good. Thank you. M morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bax. I'm representing a company called Ikaheng Electrical Construction. Uh, it's grade 8 EP, 100% black owned company with a staff of about 150 employees. Uh, Mama, two questions. I've raised them previously, but I think they are relevant individuals here to can assist. Uh, how do we penetrate, especially to the Minister Patel, how do we penetrate the African market, especially on the electrical part? How can you assist black individual companies? How do we get in there? Because it's very difficult to get in there. Practically, uh, Minister, please. The second question, that will go to the TG. Uh, how do we also form a part of a team that normally goes around the globe with the president for investment opportunities? Because we, at PBF members, we felt left behind most of the time when the president or the minister is around the globe for investment opportunities. Thank you very much for this opportunity and let the ANC grow much bigger than this. Thank you. Thank you very much. At the same table, and then we'll come to you, Denisa. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, my question, I guess, can be answered by the Minister, and the TG might also get involved in, in, in responding to this question. Because it has to do with the, the coordination between and among government departments and institutions in terms of realizing this radical economic transformation. If you look at from, from the most practical point of view, as a business, there are a number of things that you have to do to establish yourself or to start a new project. There's something called an environmental impact assessment as an there example. There are other requirements that may be uh, from different departments. As a business, that creates a lot of difficulties. We are told that in Namibia, the government has committed to a time frame of three months for an environmental impact assessment. In South Africa, an environmental impact assessment will take you more than a year, it will cost you two million rand before you do anything. Now, if our counterparts in Namibia can commit to a three months turnaround time on an environmental impact assessment, I do not understand why this Democratic Republic of South Africa cannot do the same, if not better. So, Minister, how do we ensure that government coordinates these activities? I, I, I have read the economic transformation discussion document that has been discussed on the other side. It alludes to certain things, but it does not practically say, as government, this is the coordination that needs to happen, or at least the ANC is saying to government, this is how you need to coordinate these activities to ensure that ultimately the economic, uh, radical economic transformation happens. Um, and I think it's something that needs to be uh, looked at. Um, 
it has to do also with funding. Government has created the Black Industrialist Program uh, with the DFIs as part of that and there's access to market committees. There are so many disintegrated uh, uh, institutions and initiatives towards achieving the same objective. Can government better coordinate this movement towards radical economic transformation? If it does not do that, it will be a, dim, a dream deferred again. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. And then the last uh, question for this round. I will very, I will very gladly take the no, microphone the mic, to Mama Mumzi. <laughs> how are you? Fine, how are you? Uh, Tabi, sir. Um, good morning, Ms. Einstein. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm Danisa Baloy, the president of the Black Business Council. Uh, <clears throat> Ministers, as you know, money makes the world go round. And I think Tabiso point, uh, re uh, sort of referred to that. The, our members still struggle with the DFIs, and I know that you are responsible uh, for one of the biggest, the, the, the IDC. Reality is that... Uh, uh, more than 20 years down the line, we still have a problem as black business accessing money from the IDC. Um, if we really are serious about radical economic transformation, something has got to give at the DFIs. To have um, rules and regulations that um, are not more stringent than the banks. We know at the moment that uh, the financial institution, whether they agree or not, are on an investment strike. So we depend on the DFIs. Um, how can we be sure that after this conference, <clears throat> there be a plan that will ensure that funding for black business, for small, medium-sized enterprises, take a different course altogether that will ensure that we don't fill in a million forms, a bid rack for 18 months, and then in the end don't get the funds. Lastly, how do we ensure that, um, Minister, the, the, the colluders, well, I don't even like to call them colluders because if it's the private sector and big business, they collude, black people are corrupt. No, the, the companies that break the law and in my, my view corrupt are brought to book to ensure that they help with transformation. You've, you've talked to a few who have had, um, you know, some moral Damascus and come to the, to the fore. But there are plenty more who refuse, even in the trans, uh, construction sector, to, to do the right thing. They still won't do it. And many others, and we can talk to many areas, in the, in the arts and culture, in its collusion or corruption everywhere, black business is closed out. This conference has to come up with a plan that will eliminate it once and for all, so they do not continue to collude that the value chain are opened up. I'm glad my brother spoke about it because that's the problem. Thank you, Darren. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, over to you. Well, first, <clears throat> let me thank uh, the business uh, representatives who asked those questions. At 9 o'clock this morning, I have to report for duty and go and clock in at the National Policy Conference. So I'm going to keep the remarks very brief. First, on the first person uh, who, who commented, I didn't catch the name. I, I agree that if we are going to be successful in deepening both transformation, but I'd also say growth itself, then we've got to bring black South Africans throughout the value chains of each of the key sectors of the economy. In the area of steel, we've now made some initiatives that we think are beginning to yield results, but there continue to be areas uh, of challenge. 
and the 1.5 billion rand steel competitiveness fund is going to concentrate while it's not exclusively for black south africans there's a specific concentration it's also available to black industrialists downstream which is key for our future the second one uh, around the vat i'm sure the minister of finance would be interested in uh, in commenting on that gino i hear your issues around concentration in freight and logistics that's why we're looking at the mandate again of the competition authorities. I hear you too on the issue of public servants. The word servant is a critical one. We, whether we're cabinet members or whether we're uh, departmental officials, we are there to serve South Africans. Arrogance has no place in what we do. We're there not to tell South Africans why things can't be done. We're there to help South Africans to make things happen. Because when we do that, we unlock the energy, the creativity of our people. That drives economies. That generates tax revenues. That gives us the wherewithal to be able to deal with our mandate. Bucks on the issue that you've raised about the African story, uh, let me just make this point. The big growth market on infrastructure is the rest of the African continent. It has been estimated that the infrastructure gap, uh, Treasurer General, on the continent is something like $100 billion, an enormous sum of money that has to be invested every year to be able to ensure that Africa can meet the needs of a rapidly urbanizing population and still relatively high growth rates in many parts of the continent. And so there are very practical things we can do that the South African government becomes the flag carrier for South African companies. And uh, we, can talk, we can talk separately about some of the specifics of how we can do that. But we take <clears throat> the point, Bucks, that that's a critical part of what we need to do now. Someone raised the issue of environmental impact assessments and the broader coordination. There is a lot more that government needs to do. So what we've done now is we've created a one-stop shop. One place, and by the way, it's not available only to foreign investors. It's also available to local investors. One place that you go and you say, look, we want to bring in this new investment. We want to be able to do these things. But there are many different government departments we work with. Can you help us connect these different departments and make it as seamless and easy a process as possible. That has been launched by the President. It's open for business and I encourage you to get involved with him. And as you find that they, they do good things, let us know. And where there are hiccups and challenges, let us know because we've got to iron them out. It's not going to work perfectly from day one, but the lesson from China the Chinese don't give up when there's a problem. They just fix that little problem, move on to the next one. And that's what we've got to do as South Africans. Not reinvent things all the time, but make the existing things work. On the environmental impact assessment, important to say that we have both a legal and constitutional responsibility to ensure that our economic development is sustainable, that we balance it against the needs of future generations. And that's what the EIAs are about, ensuring that the water supply is safe, that what we do in the economy doesn't contaminate water supply, doesn't disrupt communities unnecessarily. And so what we have to do with the EIA process is ensure that it has proper integrity, that it's not overturned by the courts. If we rush them, inevitably you make mistakes. Inevitably there will be someone who will appeal to the courts and your delay will be much longer. The Minister of Environmental Affairs has in fact embraced the idea of moving swiftly but at the same time paying attention to environmental sustainability. And she's come up with a really nice idea which is a strategic environmental assessment where for certain projects you look at all those projects together like a big infrastructure project. Instead of 10 or 20 separate EIAs, you can do a combined one. And her team is working closely with the economic ministries. And I think we're seeing good progress there. Uh, may I finally uh, say to, um, to uh, uh, our uh, dear colleague, uh, uh, Ms. Baloyi, that the point about development finance institutions doing their work better is well taken. We, need, we always have room to improve, but I also have good news for you. And the good news I have is that we've re-engineered both the mandate and the way in which the Industrial Development Corporation works. 
and here are the results. In this last financial year, the IDC committed 4.7 billion rand to black industrialists. This is not budget that's set aside. These are actual binding commitments. 77 projects with black industrialists that the IDC now support. And that, by the way, is a 60% increase in what the IDC did the year prior to that. If you add black empowered companies, not just black industries, but black empowered companies, then in the last financial year, the IDC committed 10.8 billion rand of capital. Can we do better? Yes, we can. Can your advice help us? Absolutely. Can we improve our systems? Yes. But let's also celebrate the significant gains we are making, and I know that you also acknowledge and support. So thank you very much. I wish I had more time to be able to engage, but um, uh, the people who ultimately represent the mandate makers want to make sure that members of cabinet are there to hear the views of members of the ANC from branches all over South Africa, democracy in action. I've really enjoyed this very brief engagement. Thank you very much. And I know the Treasurer General will be dealing with one of the questions that's been put to him. So thank you very much, Daryl, and thank you very much for the very warm reception we've had here this morning. Thank you.